Hi, my name is Richard Duffy. I am the SAP Business One Product Evangelist, and my official title at SAP is the Small Enterprise Sales and Marketing Programs Manager. On behalf of everybody at SAP, I'd like to welcome you to the SAP Partner Marketing Catalyst Program, and in particular, to session one of our program, which is entitled Discovering Your Ideal Target Market. So let's talk briefly about what marketing is all about. So chances are you may well have attended some kind of formal training on marketing. Perhaps you may even have a degree in marketing. And as part of that formal training, you would have been given a specific definition about marketing and that will have included talking about things like product, pricing and placement. You know, we talk about the three P's or the four P's of marketing. Well, I want to give you a different definition of marketing, and it's a definition of marketing that I uh, heard for the very first time from a guy called John Jantz, uh, and he is the man behind uh, duct tape marketing. Now, John's definition, and it's a definition that's worked very well for me, is that marketing is getting someone with a need for your product or service to know, like, and trust you. So you can encapsulate it at that point, but then you can take that one step further. So marketing is getting someone with a need for your product or service to know, like, and trust you so that they try, buy, repeat buy, and refer others to you. So if you think about everything that we do from a marketing perspective, that really does encapsulate the entire marketing process from top to bottom. Think about the tactics that you might be executing as the person in your organization who's responsible for marketing. So you might build a website, for example, and once you've got your website up and running, you might be doing search engine optimization, you might be doing search engine marketing. Well, what's that all about? That's about getting people to know you. For example, you might also be running some kind of advertising campaign. You might be placing ads in a magazine. You might be running a banner ad campaign on a website. Again, that's an example of a tactic which is designed to get people to know about your organization and know who you are. So that's part one. So no one's gonna buy from you unless they know who you are, and that goes without saying. Now. Unless you are a very big monopoly, maybe you're a utility or something like that, it's fair to say that there are a number of different organizations that do what you do that your customers can choose from. So how do you get them to make a decision to buy from you? Well, they have to like you. Why? People buy from people. It's a, it's a statement that we've always heard but occasionally we forget about that in this world of you know focus on brands and so on. At the end of the day, people buy from people. Now, people will buy from you when they like you. So what do you need to do? You need to give them reasons to like you. Now, when will someone like you? Well, they're gonna like you when you help them solve a problem, when you give them some information that they don't currently have. Think about it from our perspective. We're selling ERP solutions and business intelligence solutions. How often does your prospective customer go out and buy an ERP or a BI solution? Chances are, if they're unlucky, it's probably once every maybe four to five years. Traditional wisdom, traditional thinking says that they buy a new ERP system every seven years. So. Think about, from your perspective, how often do you go out and sell an ERP system to a customer? Well, if you're effective, if you've got a, a good, strong business, chances are you are adding at least one customer per month. So you're an expert. You're an expert on the process. You're an expert on all things relating to ERP, but your customer is not. This is a process they go through once every five to six years, and again, think about it. For many of your prospective customers, they might have been through an ERP or a BI selection process before, and maybe it wasn't the most pleasant experience for them. Maybe they made a mistake. So 
right now they are a little bit concerned about what's going to happen in the process. So your job is to give them information. I think about it, why do people come to your website? Why do they engage with you in a sales cycle? Well, they do that because they want information. So they're going to like you when you make it easy for them to get that information, when you give them the information that answers those questions that they may have, or better still, even answers the questions that they didn't know they had to ask. Give you some examples of some marketing assets that you can create that help build that concept of like. If you are, for example, helping somebody choose an ERP solution, you might produce white papers. So you might have a white paper which says the five things you need to know before you implement a new ERP solution, or the 10 secrets that ERP implementation experts know, or you could have other things like the three core components of a world-class business intelligence solution, or maybe something like on-demand or on-premise, the five key steps you need to take to ensure you choose the right solution. So think about the questions that your prospect has got going through their mind and answer those questions via white papers, via blog posts. Those are the kinds of things that are going to help a prospect like you. Why are they going to like you? Again, because you have given them information that puts them in control of the process. So then the third one, if we said marketing is no like and trust, how do you get them to trust you? Well, really, this is about proving to your prospective customer that you are the expert and that you have done this before. So a great way of building trust is through the usage of things like case studies, existing customer videos, and so on. So those are some examples of the tactics or the assets that you can create that help build that know, like, and trust. Now then, as you go through the process, and then start thinking about the next things, which is, you know, so that they try, buy, repeat, buy, and refer others to you. Well, you're gonna to need to have marketing assets uh, that, that really help guide a person through that process. And I'm gonna introduce you to what we call the marketing hourglass, which is gonna give you a structured way of thinking about that marketing process and making sure you've got the right um, assets and tactics in place. But before we dive into this whole thing about tactics, and for many people, when they think about marketing, marketing, they think it's, it's a lot about tactics. Oftentimes, I get to talk to SAP partners and they say to me, well, what's the latest campaign I can use? Or, you know, what about social media? Or, you know, what do I need to do with my website that's going to make me a more effective marketer that's going to, you know, generate uh, lots of highly qualified prospects for my business? Well, think about all of those things. They are fundamentally tactics. Now, the thing that I always say to people is before you even get engaged around this whole discussion of what should you do from a tactical perspective, is you need to think, first of all, about strategy. So this is the second point I want you to take away from this training. First point, marketing, getting someone with a, or people with a need for your product or service to know, like, and trust you. Point number two is always think strategy before tactics. Before you start executing any kind of marketing activity, you should be thinking, well, where does this fit in to my overall strategy? Sun Tzu, the guy who uh, many people quote, uh, he wrote a book called The Art of War, and he said, tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. And I think this is absolutely right, because you can be executing great tactics, tactics that have worked for other organizations, but they don't work for you. Why? Because it's not aligned to your strategy. It's not aligned to your strategy, which first and foremost, you need to think about who is my ideal target customer. Because when you've defined that, from that point, 
everything else starts to flow from a strategic perspective. So you think about who's my ideal target market, and then you start thinking about, well, how do I differentiate my organization in the mind of that ideal target customer? So all of that is about defining your marketing strategy before you start doing tactics. Now, I know it's a big challenge because you know, most people are action-oriented individuals. And we have managers and teammates who are always saying to us, if we're responsible for marketing, what are we doing? You know, what, what actions are we taking to generate leads? But again, I encourage you, even if it's somebody from SAP who comes to you and says, you should run this particular campaign, here's a new piece of content to put up on your website or whatever the case may be. Always think first, where does this fit into our strategy? And if you haven't got a strategy, well, hopefully by the end of this training, you're going to have everything you need to help you build a strategy. But if you're still not clear on it, what do you need to do? Pick up the phone and give me a call. I'd be more than happy to talk with you about what you need to do to put in place your marketing strategy. So, strategy before tactics, very, very important. Why do we do marketing? Let's talk about it for a second. Now, oftentimes the reasons why people, or the reasons that people give me why we do marketing is they say, well, we want to generate leads. You know, we want to... Um, get people to know, like, and trust us. Uh, we want to, you know, launch a new product into the market. Well, for me, it's a little bit simpler than that. And effective marketing does one thing. And, and if you think about the biggest challenge that we face when we're actually out there selling a product or solution, one of the biggest challenges is what? Well, many people tell me it's price competition. So effective marketing eliminates price competition. Now that's a pretty strong statement. Let me explain to you why I think that's the case. Effective marketing eliminates price competition because most people get engaged in a discussion with you about price because they have no other benchmark to measure you your product or service against another company product or service. So when they cannot differentiate, when they look at your solution and they look at a solution from another organization and both solutions roughly do the same thing. You have an implementation methodology, your competitor has an implementation methodology. It's all very much the same. So think about it from your prospect's perspective, and this is point number three. Whenever you're doing anything from a marketing perspective, it's difficult, easy to say, hard to do, step back, imagine you are a prospect, and evaluate it from their perspective. But what is your prospect sitting there thinking? Well, they're thinking these all look kind of the same. The only thing they can utilize to differentiate is price. So suddenly you get you end up in a bidding war. So if you are in a situation where you're always competing on price, I'm gonna make a contentious statement. My challenge to you is think about, is there enough of a differentiation between your organization, your product or service, and your competitors? Now, it could well be that you're competing with another SAP partner. It does happen. You're both selling SAP Business One. Maybe you're both selling uh, SAP Crystal Server. Maybe you're both selling uh, Business Objects Edge. So what's the difference? If the product is the same, the difference is what you do with it. So you have to figure out how are you gonna differentiate yourself in the mind of your prospective customer. Effective marketing will help you do just that. So. Marketing, getting people with a need for your product or service to know, like, or trust you. Why do we want to have effective marketing? Because effective marketing helps eliminate price competition. It helps you differentiate your organization, your product or service from your competitors. So let's talk for a second about how to do that. And I believe that there is a systematic approach that you can take which will help you address this. 
Now, what is a system? A system is a series of, and this is my definition, maybe you might be able to find this if you went out onto Wikipedia and did a search or whatever, but my definition of a system is a series of predefined steps that deliver a known outcome. So what do we sell? We sell ERP solutions. Uh, another way of describing ERP solutions is financial systems or business management systems. So if we're selling a system, if there are different systems in place that deliver certain outcomes, why should marketing be any different? Give me an example. Take McDonald's. McDonald's, and I think from memory, the full name of McDonald's in the United States might be McDonald's, um, either McDonald's Systems of America or it might be McDonald's Franchise Systems or something like that. But fundamentally, and the same thing applies for franchises, what does a franchise offer? It offers a system that says if you follow these steps, this will be the outcome that you'll get, and that outcome is profit. So McDonald's have developed a system for doing things, a system for, for example, producing a Big Mac the same way no matter what country you go to. Two old beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Okay. Um, McDonald's, because they have this systematic approach of doing things, they are able to get 13, 14, 15 year olds, you know, people like uh, my son who worked at a McDonald's, uh, who sometimes I have difficulty getting him to make his bed in the morning, uh, they are able to get him to produce a Big Mac the same way every time why the system is the solution. It's a structured way of going about the process. So I believe marketing can be delivered utilizing a similar systematic approach. Now, what are the steps in our marketing system? Well, the first step is to focus on your ideal client. And that's really what this session is about. It's about determining who your ideal client is. The second step, is to find the right problem that that ideal client is looking to solve and explain to them how your product or service helps them solve that problem. The third point is about, or the third step in our systematic approach is about packaging your business to make it easy for your prospective customer to understand how you are going to help them solve that particular problem with your product or service. The fourth step is about creating marketing materials that educate your prospect. Remember, we talked about know, like and trust, and we said that the reason why people engage with you is because they want to understand more about the particular problem that they're trying to solve, how they're gonna solve that. So how do you do that? Well, you need to make sure that every piece of marketing material that you create educates the prospect about how to solve that problem and educates them about how your specific process or your specific product helps them solve that problem. The next step is think about harnessing the internet. Think about how do I take all of these fantastic new tools and resources that I have at my disposal how do I utilize social media? How do I utilize search engine marketing? How do I build a website that effectively engages my prospect? How do I take all of these different internet tools and use those effectively to help build know, like, and trust? Then think about the next step being about lead generation from every angle. So what do I mean by this? Well, we talk about the three pillars of a lead generation engine and they are advertising, also public relations, and referrals. So in a future session, I'm gonna talk about each one of those in more detail. But we talk about those three areas, and now, by the way, when I talk about public relations, I'm not talking about what we might traditionally think about PR, sending out press releases, that kind of thing. Um, but we want to think about all those different aspects, the traditional way that we think about generating leads through advertising, but you know, again, utilizing referrals effectively. And I'm going to give you some specific steps about how you build a referral system in your business. So 
Why is that important? Well, many partners I talk to, I ask them the question, what is the best kind of lead that you get in your business? And they say, well, it's a referral. Why? Because they're pre-qualified. You didn't have to spend any money to go out and generate that referral. They came to you as a result of something that you'd already done effectively for an existing customer that made them say, hey, I want to refer somebody to you. Then I asked them the question, what are you specifically doing to encourage new referrals? Nine times out of 10, the answer is, well, nothing. I'm gonna give you a process that you can follow which will help you generate those referrals in a systematic approach. So that's what we talk about, lead generation from every angle. The next step in our marketing system is converting leads with nurturing. It's fair to say that not every person who you strike up a relationship with as a result of your marketing, not every person's ready to purchase in the next 30, 60, 90 days. So what you need to do is you need to keep front of mind with them. You need to keep engaged with them as they go through the process so that when they're ready to buy, you are the organization that they come to. So that's what nurturing is all about. And then the final step, and again, one of the most important, is to live by a calendar. Why is that important? Well, chances are, by the end of these sessions, you're gonna be sitting there and there are so many things that you're going to have on your plate that you're gonna think, well, I've gotta do this and this and this and this. And you're gonna be thinking, well, how am I gonna possibly get all of these things done? And the way to do that is by taking a structured approach. And that's what we mean by living by the calendar. Don't try and do everything all at once. Think about what are the most important actions you need to take and then map them out, schedule them and execute them in a structured way. So living by the calendar, very, very important. And a great book, by the way, if you find yourself from time to time procrastinating, thinking about how should I um, get things done, well, a great book that I found um, that can help you think about this in a more structured way is funnily enough, called Getting Things Done. Now, I can't remember the name of the author, but I am gonna come back to you uh, and I am going to um, give you the full details of that at the end of this session, because these sessions are recorded live. Uh, so at the end of this session, I'll come back, I'll give you all the details you need about how to go out and find that particular book, Getting Things Done. Of course, you could just do a search for that name uh, and you'll see it it's available on amazon.com or you know, your online bookseller of choice. And of course, it's available uh, on the iPad or on the Kindle. So, live by the calendar, very, very important. So those are the steps that we have in our marketing system. Let's now move on and start talking about those in more detail. So the first one we talked about, if you remember, was focus on the ideal client. So what's this really about, focusing on the ideal client? This is about identifying those organizations who really are perfect for the solution that you offer. They're perfect for the product you offer, they're perfect for the solution you offer, and they're perfect for your organization. So what do I mean by perfect? Well. First thing that's worthwhile looking at is thinking about what is the definition of an ideal client. And there's a couple of characteristics of an ideal client which are fairly generic without talking about products or services. And if you think about it, these are people that, that they pay their bills on time. The work that you do with them is profitable. They appreciate what it is that you do. They don't beat your staff up when your staff come out on site. When you are sitting there thinking that you, you know, today I have to go and visit customer X, you actually look forward to it because you know that they appreciate what you do and you like working with them. And chances are they are already referring people to you. So those are some of the generic characteristics, if you like, of what we would call, you know, an ideal client. So they're current profitable clients for you and they already refer business to you. So then if you think about how is a good way of identifying who those people are, well, there's a great place to go and learn more 
about those ideal clients and what they want. And guess what? Chances are you have people in your existing customer base who meet your definition of an ideal client. Well, I hope you do. If you have a client base full of people who you hate, um, who don't pay their bills on time, who beat your staff up, who don't appreciate what you do, chances are maybe you need to clean out your entire customer base and start again from scratch, but I doubt very much that that's the situation you're in. So there's a great way, and you'll see it actually displayed on the, this particular slide, there's a great way of identifying those customers. And a good way of doing it is get a list of all of your customers and then map them out. Now, those of you who are familiar with the Gartner Magic Quadrant will be familiar with this kind of diagram, you know, where you have... Um, you know, up in the top left-hand corner, we have those people who refer business to you, but they're not profitable. The bottom left-hand corner, you have those people who don't refer and they're not profitable. In the right-hand side, you have those people who are profitable, but they don't refer. And then in the top far right-hand corner, where all these two things intersect, you have those who refer to you and those who are profitable. That is your group of ideal target clients. So you look at those people, those customers that fit that description. And I'm gonna provide you with an Excel spreadsheet that's going to help you go through this process. But you itemize who all of those customers are and then you start looking in more detail at what are some of the other characteristics of those organizations. Because what you're basically saying is, you know what, if they are my ideal client, I want to find more people just the same as them. Then you've got to ask the question, well, how did I get to have them as customers? Why did they buy from me? Why do they continue to buy from me? What do they like about my organization? What do they think about my organization? What do they think I could do better? These are the kinds of questions. Even another example, think about search engine optimization. We're always thinking about, well, what keywords do we need to use in our websites when we do our search engine optimization? Go to those ideal clients and ask them. If you were looking for a business that does what we do, what would you type in to Google to find us? If they're your ideal client, their answers and the characteristics of those businesses is what you're trying to identify so you can find more of them. So what are those characteristics that you're looking at? Well, there's four uh, traditional characteristics that you could look at. The first of those is demographics. Then you have psychographics. You have geographics and behavior. So what are each one of these four? Well, I think demographics is fairly clear. What demographics is, it's really about things that are, are statistical. It's a great way of thinking about it. What industries are they in? What standard industry classification codes do they belong to? How many people do they have working in the business? What, um, what amount of revenue are they generating? How rapidly are they growing? So these are things which can be clearly defined by looking at some numbers, statistical um, representations of those answers, if you like. The second one is uh, geographics. This, again, is an easy one to look at as well. Where are they located? You know, are they located in a particular area? Now, here's a great tip for you. Most of you have heard of Google Maps. I use Google Maps a lot. I've started to put together a number of different Google Maps that map out all of the SAP Business One partners that we have, for example, all around the world. So you can go to a map and you can see a little push pin location showing where there is an SAP Business One partner in that part of the world. So why not go into Google Maps and create your own map and on that map, list every single one of your customers. Now, this doesn't have to be visible to the whole world. This is something that can just be private, just for you. And then map them all out. Then suddenly, what do you have? You have a detailed map showing you where all of your customers sit. Do you have certain clusters where you have a large number of customers here, 
a large number of customers here, uh, some scattered around over here, uh, some of them scattered along a particular main road. Once you've mapped it out and you can analyse it visually, you can then see maybe there's some trend or something about that particular area that's making it uh, particularly attractive to your kind of target customer. What do I mean by that? Maybe your uh, ideal target customer is in wholesale and distribution. And they're all clustered around a particular um, suburb which is well known for having distribution centres and so on. You might not have kind of thought about that before, but when you look at it graphically represented on a map, suddenly it makes sense. So if you're going to go and run a marketing campaign, do you think it might make sense to run a marketing campaign where those existing customers are? Why? Because you've got so many there, maybe there's more there that meet that requirement. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about the geographics. Where are they? You know, and then you can start to do analysis and say, well, how many more are there in that area? Should I be doing marketing campaigns there and so on? Once we get beyond the geographics and the demographics, we start to get into some areas that are a little bit more difficult, areas like psychographics and behavior. So what do we mean by psychographics and behavior? Well, this is the way I like to look at this. This is the way they think, the way they behave. For example, are they small family companies? If they are, how, is, how are decisions made in those companies? If the decisions are made by the owner, then you're going to need to interact with them in a certain way. Uh, if they are Fortune 500 companies or their subsidiaries of Fortune 500 companies, then they're going to go through a different process when they make their selection decisions. Does the CEO make the decision? Does the financial controller make the decision? Do they look to third parties for advice about business solutions and the business systems that they make? So really what you're looking at is you're trying to understand more about the way they think and the way they act. So again, the way they think, psychographics, the way they act, behavior. When you've identified all of these different aspects of uh, or these different characteristics, if you like, of your ideal target customer. It then makes it much easier for you to now do everything else from a marketing perspective. You can now go and buy marketing lists if that's something, if that's a tactic that you've determined you need to do. You can now go out to the database marketing company and you can say, look, I want wholesale distribution companies within a 30 kilometer radius of Sydney that are growing by 20% per annum, they're turning over between five and $20 million per annum, they have between 10 and 30 employees. Now you can really start to get a better picture and you can buy a database list like that. Many people I talk to, I ask them, who's your target customer? And the answer comes back to a certain extent, uh, this is a, again a contentious statement, uh, our target market is people with money. Well, everybody wants people with money, right? If they don't have money, they're not going to buy from you. But can you go to a database marketing company and say, I want a list of people with money? No. Can you write a marketing campaign that addresses the specific pain points of people with money? No. But you can build your marketing materials around addressing the needs or addressing the concerns and pain points of a customer in the food wholesaling business that are within a 30 kilometer radius of you know the central business district of Sydney who are growing by say 10 to 15 percent per annum who have 30 employees because you know what their pain points are and guess what Again, going back, if you have customers like this already in your client base, if you don't know what those issues are that those potential clients may have, you can go back to your existing clients and ask them the question. And that's one of the things that I would encourage you to do. So I mentioned I'm going to give you a spreadsheet. What this will do, it will give you the ability to itemize out all of your customers and then determine what are the questions that you want to ask. And then go and pick, let's say, your top 10 or even your top five 
and go and sit down with them across the table and have a conversation. Don't build a survey monkey survey. Don't hand it off to your telemarketers to get them to do it because in order for this process to work, you're really going to want to engage in a, a deep conversation where you're going to be asking them detailed questions about their business and you're going to be asking them for feedback about your business and about what it is that you do. So it's the kind of conversation that can't be handled in a you know, over a telephone line to a certain extent, unless you've got a good relationship with the person. It can't be handled by a, a telemarketer, again, unless that person has a good relationship already. So you go and you sit down with them and you ask them a couple of key questions. Questions like, why did you choose to buy from our organisation? Why did you, um, why do you choose to keep doing business with our organisation? Do you refer people to us? And if so, why? And if not, why not? These kinds of questions, the question about, you know, what would you search for on Google if you're looking for a company that did what we, that, that does what we do? Uh, another point might be, what is it about businesses, about companies like us that frustrates you? Because remember, one of the things you're trying to identify is what is the need, uh, what is the potential unmet need that your ideal target market has, because that's going to tell you, do I have additional products or services that I could offer to this target market? So these are the kinds of questions you're going to answer, you're going to ask, and they're going to give you some answers. I'll give you a classic example. If you went to all of your people in your organization today, and you ask them, why do you think people buy from us? and get their answers. And then you go out to your customers and ask your customers, why did you buy from us? And compare the answers, I guarantee you. In many instances, they might be diametrically opposed. If you're an SAP partner, you might say, well, part of the reason why people buy from us is because we have qualified staff, you know, we're an SAP gold partner, um, you know, we have good reference customers and so on and so forth. But I guarantee you every other SAP partner will probably say the same thing. So this is why it's important to listen to what your customers are telling you. And you know what I've seen, entire organizational marketing and entire organizational positioning change on the basis of the feedback that people get from their existing customers. We thought that people bought from us because you know, we had certified staff, we had good reference customers and so on. But the customer turned around and said, well, the reason why we bought from you is you turned up. You did what you said you would do. When you said you would come out at a certain time, you were there. And every other organization in your market space is frustrating the hell out of me because they never turn up when they say they will. And you guys did. Well, suddenly your entire marketing position, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about in a future session, could well be based around that whole aspect of reliability. And guess what? When you've got a customer saying it, suddenly, your marketing positioning is, you know, at company X, we do what we say we will. But don't take our word for it. Here's what our customers think. And then you quote the comments from your customers. So for that reason, when you're doing these interviews, I would encourage you, go out and ask the questions. And if possible, ask for permission from the customer to record the conversation. Okay? Why should you do that? Well, when they're giving you information, you don't want to be focused too much on writing down what they're telling you because you want to be actively engaged in listening and engaging with them in the discussion. When you stop and write something, writing things down, you may forget a particular key point that they made. Now, give me one second because I'm going to show you a particular tool that I like to use which I find very, very helpful when doing these kinds of interviews. I'll be right back. Okay, so thanks for bearing with me. What I wanted to show you, uh, and again, we won't look in this in uh, too much detail, but what I'm using here is a device called a pulse pen. And it comes uh, from a company called Livescribe, and it comes with these books. Now, to buy a pulse pen, eight gigabyte pulse pens, about $199, and these books are maybe, I think, $20 for a, a packet of four or five. Now, how it works is this. When you're out there talking to the prospective customer, 
you ask them, of course, for their permission to record the conversation, and you might say something like, you know, I want to make sure that I don't miss anything you tell me. So would you mind if I just recorded our conversation? So that way I can go back to my office and listen to what we said and pick up on some things that I might have missed. And they're, of course, being a reasonable person, A, they'll be impressed that you're taking the time to take notes and really listen, um, but B, they're gonna see that it's gonna be an advantage to them. So then what do you do? This is the book and it has these little controls on the bottom, so all I do is I click on the but button marked record, and you wouldn't have heard that, um, but it's now recording everything that I am saying, and it'll now record everything that my prospect is saying. Now, if I go in here and I start making notes in my book, and let's say I fill two or three pages with notes, when I finish the, re the interview with my, prospect or with my customer, or even a prospective customer, I hit the stop button, and then I go back to my office, and I'm looking at my notes and I'm thinking, hmm, what was I thinking when I wrote that note? All you do, take your pulse pen and you tap next to the note and it immediately starts playing back exactly what you were saying at that particular point in time when you were writing that note. So it gives you a quick way of jumping back to those points. And one other thing, and no, I'm not sponsored by Pulse or Livescribe, but the great thing with this particular device is you can plug it in to your computer and the entire page that you wrote is actually rendered graphically off this. Just the same as if you had scanned that page, guess what, the Pulse Pen has stored exactly what that page looks like and then you can save that for your consultants, for example, that are out there taking notes during the implementation process. You can record everything that's said, and that can be part of your project documentation. Really, really great tool. So just wanted to take a couple of seconds and show that to you. So I'm just going to put this down. I'll be back in a second. Okay, so you've been out and you've done your interview with your, uh, with your customer, and you've gotten all that great feedback from them about the reasons why they, they do business with you, why they chose you, and so on and so forth. So. As a result of that, you can now really start to think more clearly around what it is that you need to do from a marketing perspective. When I'm talking to my prospect, what position do I need to, to, to put across? When I am you know, trying to address their pain points, what are their pain points? When I'm trying to differentiate my organization from other organizations out there in the market, what is it? in the words of my customers that differentiates us, not just my words, because that, again, is gonna give you more credibility. And think about it, one of the other things you might wanna consider is actually getting yourself uh, a video camera. You can even use, if you've got an iPhone 4, it has a high definition video camera. Carry that with you. If it's your phone, probably you carry it with you anyway. But when you're out there with an existing customer and they start saying something nice about you or, you know, because customers will give you little testimonials when they're talking to you. They don't set out to give you a testimonial, but they'll say, you know what, I just wanted to thank you for last week. You know, um, John, the, your consultant, we had a problem and it was Friday night. He, he, I know he was going to, you know, going to a concert, but he stayed there with us uh, to make sure we got those documents out the door. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you for that. So when somebody's giving you that kind of information, great testimonial, say to them, hey, would you mind if I just got that on video? Pull out your iPhone, pull out your flip camera if you've got one, uh, and just say, let me just quickly grab that on video. Fantastic way of getting testimonials from your customers. But I digress. So now you've got all of that information. It's time for you to do your first activity. What I would like you to do right now is pause the video and I want you to take 10 minutes, take 15 minutes if you like, this is video so you can keep me paused for as long as you want, um, but what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to write a paragraph describing your ideal client as if I was looking to refer that ideal client to you. So I want to refer somebody to you, but in order for me to know who to refer to you, rather than referring a whole bunch of people who might not be uh, applicable for you, you need to explain to me what your ideal client looks like. So take 10 minutes to do that, and remember, 
demographics, geographics, psychographics, and behavior. And if you can't remember those points that we talked about, of course you can rewind the video or go back to your training materials which you'll have in your orange folder. So, 10 minutes and I'll see you at the end of that 10 minutes. So you've gone and you've done all of your research now, you've identified what your ideal target customer looks like. So what's the next thing you've got to do? Well, the next thing you've got to do is you've got to find the right problem to solve for them. You've got to find what it is that differentiates your organization from other people who could also solve that problem for your ideal target market. Or potentially, you have to identify an opportunity, an unmet need that exists within that target market that you can identify. So how do you go about going through that process? Well, we already talked about going through the interview process with your existing customers, asking them those questions. You know, why did you choose us? What is it that frustrates you about businesses like ours? What could we do differently? Are there things which you believe an organization like ours could provide for you that we're not currently providing? Asking those questions. The second thing you can do is do research into what your competitors are doing. What is it that your competitors offer that you don't? Is there something in their product or service mix that they have which addresses something that your customers have said that they want which you don't currently offer. How do you bring that into your uh, product offering? And again, uh, I would encourage you to look at that in all aspects of your business. Recently, we just ran some training sessions on building a demonstration system for your, uh, for your business one, your SAP Business One practice. And one of the things I talked about there was making sure you understand how your competitors are demonstrating their solutions, how they're positioning their solutions, so you can make sure that you're doing a similar thing. So do not underestimate the importance of that competitor research. Not that it becomes, you know, uh, all-encompassing focus for you on, you know, beating your competitors, but you have to know what they're doing. The third thing that you can also do is then research not just your local market, but research the world market. Are there things happening somewhere else in a uh, market in the world that's impacting on the people who have those characteristics that your ideal target market display, but in a different country. Maybe, and I know many of you, uh, because we have SAP partners all over the world, you know, some of you might be, uh, I ran training, for example, recently in Budapest. So you might be in Budapest and, um, you know, you might be thinking, well, what is the next thing that I could begin to offer to my customers? Well, what's going on in the United States? What's happening in the UK? Is there something happening somewhere else that you, know, you believe is going to help solve a problem for your, for your target market? Do the research around that and understand that because that's going to help you identify what that problem is, uh, what that opportunity is that you have to solve with your business. Now, then of course you have to figure out exactly how am I gonna address that, but we're gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail. So if you think about it, what fundamentally are people buying from you? If there are three or four other organizations who offer the same product that you do, if there are three or four other organizations who offer a product or a service that is similar to the product or service that you offer, what is it that your customers are buying? Well, they're buying your uniqueness. So what do I mean by that? They are buying from you because there is something particular about the way you offer it. And if there isn't anything that's unique about the way you offer a product or service that's different to everybody else in the market, what are they going to do? They're gonna go back and they're gonna try and differentiate you on price. We didn't talk about this, but what's one of the problems with trying to differentiate on price? Well. There's always somebody who's willing to go out of business faster than you are. So there's always somebody who will sell a product or service cheaper than you. So it's a bad place to try and differentiate. So where can you differentiate? 
Well, you'll see on the particular slide that I've, uh, I've got up on the screen at the moment, there's a couple of different areas. So let's go through them in a little bit of detail. You can look from a product or a service perspective. Is there a market niche that your product or service addresses that nobody else's product or service does? Maybe you have a complementary solution with your SAP business all-in-one offering that nobody else has that really meets the requirements of high-tech manufacturers. So no one else offers that solution, you've got a great way of differentiating yourself and making yourself unique. No one else has it. But don't forget, potentially there are other people out there who are doing their research and they're discovering that you're the only person who offers that and they're now trying to figure out how do they make it possible for them to offer it so they can compete with you. So sometimes those things, those differentiating points, those niche markets only stay niche for a while. But of course, your opportunity there is to build yourself up as being the go-to company when you need a solution for high-tech manufacturing, SAP Business All-in-One is the right solution and your company is absolutely the go-to partner to buy that solution from. So the second area is your offer or how you package your product or service to solve a specific problem. Give you an example. Let's say your target market it might be small businesses. And one of the challenges that many small businesses have is they have sometimes some challenges around affordability, around funding the purchase of major capital expenditure items. So getting the money to purchase a new ERP or business intelligence solution, the new hardware that works around that they're going to need to, to, to deploy that solution on. So maybe one of the things that's different about your offering is that you have figured out a way to finance that entire solution that breaks it down into a per user per month offering that makes it easy for that target customer to afford your solution. Give you another example. Maybe your message of value, your unique habit. Give you an example. And this is where I'm going to start to get a little bit uh, out there, if you like, in terms of some of the suggestions that I'm going to make to you. And I know when I've made some of these suggestions to other SAP partners, they've looked at me as if I was on drugs, you know, what's this guy thinking? But I'm going to propose it to you, and you never know. It might be something which stimulates a thought process for you, and you might figure out that this is something which works. What do I mean by a message of value or a unique habit? So this is something about the way that you do business, something that reflects what it is that makes you unique, but it's not necessarily called out specifically. It's not something that you can explain. It's something that you do. Let's say, for example, when a customer says to you, okay, I like your proposal, we've decided we want to do business with you, and uh, we'd like to go ahead with an implementation. What's the first thing? Thing that they probably receive from you after that. Chances are, if you're like many organizations, the first thing they're going to receive is an invoice asking them for money. So what if, for example, you sent them out a gift basket and with a note signed by all of your implementation team say, with a note saying, just wanted to welcome you to our family uh, we're really pleased that you decided to purchase your SAP solution from our organization. We look forward to being of service, so on and so forth. We recognize this is a major milestone. So to help you celebrate, here is a gift basket with a bottle of champagne, you know, some nibblies, some chocolates, whatever the case may be. Is that different? Do any of your competitors do that? No. It's going to get people to talk about you give you another example. Let's take that one step further. What do you do when you're not selected? Let's say you've been going through that process, you're demonstrating the solutions and you get to a point where the prospective customer says, look, I'm sorry, um, you know, we're moving to our next phase in the selection process and unfortunately we've decided not to invite you to continue along the process. What do you do? Do you swear and curse and you know, wish that the day had never occurred when they darkened your doorstep? Well, maybe you do. Here's an alternative. 
Why not send them a thank you note, maybe with a bottle of wine or again a bottle of champagne, you will know what's applicable and say something like this. Hi, um, we just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to present our solution to you. We recognise that uh, at this stage we weren't successful. We certainly believe that our solution was worth taking further, but we understand at this point you've decided not to. Along the way, you reach milestones in your selection criteria, and this is a pretty big milestone, you know, moving to that next phase. To help you celebrate moving to that next milestone, we'd like to present you with this bottle of champagne so you can celebrate um, taking that next step. So what have you done? Again, you're making them think well of you. No like, and trust, remember, that's what we originally talked about. Now they're going to like you. Are they going to remember you? Yes, they are. Why are they going to remember you? Because you're the guys who sent them the gift even though you weren't selected. Now, how many implementation or how many evaluation processes stop further along the path? So you might have been excluded now, but what happened? Did they eventually go and choose something else? Maybe they didn't. Okay, so what are they then going to do? Well, they're going to potentially want to come back and they're going to want to talk to people again. Are they going to want to talk to you? Well, they're certainly going to remember you, so hopefully the answer to that is yes. What if they choose a solution from one of your competitors? Does every implementation work out the way that people expect? No. So when it doesn't work out, who are they going to come back to? Well, potentially they're going to come back to you. Why? Because they're going to remember you. Take it one step further, with that note, maybe you might want to include a little uh, comment there and say, I would like, uh, if I may, to take five or ten minutes of your time just to understand exactly what it was that we did or didn't do that made you choose to not go further down the path with us. I'll call you on Thursday at 9 a.m. Uh, and if you could just spare me five minutes, I'd really appreciate it. Do it in a handwritten note. Don't type it up. Handwritten note. Why? Again, it's personalised, it's different, and as Oscar Wilde once said, there's only one thing worse than being talked about, and that's not being talked about. So you want to be memorable. Those are examples of what I call your message of value or your unique habit. Maybe, for example, you may also, when somebody becomes a customer, what happens when they go live? Well, apart from you breathing a sigh of relief, um, probably not a hell of a lot. So when they go live, why not put together uh, a little bit of a celebration for them and then work that celebration that you have? Maybe you come out and you buy them pizzas and beer when they go live. Or an example I gave when I was in China recently, maybe you come out and as part of that you have a little fireworks celebration out the front of the business. Um, you know, something that's going to make everybody go, whoa, gee, what's going on down there? And people will come up and ask, hey, what are you doing? Well, we just went live on our new uh, ERP system and we're having a little celebration. Is that different? Absolutely. Then maybe the person might say, "Oh, what did you? What was so different about what you uh, what you chose?" And then they start asking questions, and next thing you know, maybe you've got a referral. So again, it's about thinking about all these different ways that uh, you can interact with your customers or your prospective customers, and what's going to be the outcome of that. Number four, a guarantee. This is always guaranteed to um, cause some consternation and some discussion when I present this in a live environment. Do you offer a money-back guarantee on your products or services? Now when I ask this question, most partners look at me and they go, are you insane? Um, we would never offer that. And the question I ask them is, why wouldn't you? Can you imagine the power of being the only provider in your market who offers a 100% money back guarantee on your solution. Now, why do most implementations go wrong? Most implementations go wrong because of things that uh, happen from the customer's side. Why do implementations run late? Chances are 80 to 90% of the time, it's things that you don't have any control over. So let's say, for example, you had a uh, a guarantee which said, we guarantee you'll go live within 30 days. 
All right, well, what's part of that guarantee? You're gonna do the things that you're gonna do, and I'm assuming that you will do what you say you're gonna do, and the customer is gonna do a bunch of things that they said they were gonna do. So you come out and you say, okay, I'll be out next Tuesday, we're gonna do your data migration. In order for that to happen, you have to do this, 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 and this. Is that all okay? Customer nods their head and says, yep, absolutely, we're gonna do all of those things. You get out there on Tuesday, it's not done. You say, well, why not? Oh, you know, John, who was the guy who was focused on that, he's our best guy and we needed to put him off on into an urgent project. And unfortunately, Mary, she's been sick for the last three days and she wasn't able to do her part. Well, guess what? Is that your fault? No, it's not. Does that mean they're not gonna go live? Yes, it does. Does that mean you have to meet your guarantee? No, it doesn't because all you're guaranteeing is that you will do what you say you will do. If they don't meet their requirements, then the guarantee is null and void, okay? So all you need to do in your guarantee is make sure it's lined up very clearly. What are you guaranteeing? You're guaranteeing your products and services. If your customer does not fulfill their part of the bargain, then the guarantee is null and void, okay? You buy a new refrigerator or a hairdryer. The hairdryer says, do not use this whilst in the shower, okay? If the customer decides to use the hairdryer in the shower and it blows up, Okay, is the warranty null and void? Of course it is, because it was not designed to be used that way. It's a strange kind of example, I know, but a great way of thinking about it. So again, is that gonna work for everybody? No. Is it gonna work for you? Maybe it will, maybe it won't. The key to this, though, is thinking about what is it that your customer is looking for? If you know in your market, your customers have struggled uh, with other implementations in the past where they've had failed implementations or people haven't delivered, uh, whatever the case may be. So that's one of the blocks that you have to get past in that process to get them to know, like, and trust you so that they try, buy, repeat, buy, and refer others to you. Then maybe a guarantee is the way of solving that problem. Another one, is there something that you do that's different to the competition? Maybe the competition offer their product a certain way. What is it that you can do uh, which is different to the way they offer their product or service? And again, this is why understanding and studying what your competitors are about is really, really important. A Couple of other things, um, you know, we've kind of touched on those already in some of my earlier examples, and that's the way you do business. Give you another example. Again, this is about being memorable, about being different. Now, is it about being different for difference's sake? Not really, but sometimes it can help. Give you a classic example. Let's say maintenance. Many organizations struggle with selling the concept of maintenance, getting customers to renew their maintenance. Now, do you have periods of time where you have consultants who are not uh, you know, fully utilized? What do you do with them during that time? Do they sit around waiting for something to do, waiting for another project to start up or whatever the case may be? Well, what if you were to do this? You were to say, when you become a customer of our organization and you um, sign up for our maintenance program, we're going to deliver to you once a year uh, our free of charge systems health check. And what happens in that systems health check, you send out one of your consultants to come out and do a systems health check. How are they going for hard disk space? You know, are the data files indexed? Are their backup processes running correctly? Whatever the case may be, you determine what goes into the health check. But then make it a little bit different, okay? When the person from your organization goes out to the health check, maybe you get them dressed up in a doctor's outfit, okay? Doctor's scrubs, why? Because I'm here to do your health check. You get them to carry a little clipboard, maybe a stethoscope around their neck so they can listen into the server and see how the server is performing. Is it making any noises that it shouldn't or whatever the case may be? Again, you will know whether or not this is right for you or your target market. But it's just an example of how you can do things that are a little bit different and have a little bit of fun. Who says that because we're selling ERP software, risk and compliance management solutions or business intelligence, who says it all has to be tight-shirted, buttoned up um, and formal. Now, if you're working with Fortune 500 companies, chances are if you bump into the CEO of the company or the chairman of the board and you're standing there dressed up like a doctor in their, uh, in their elevator, that might not necessarily be the best approach to take. But again, like I said, 
think differently. Think about what is it that you can do to differentiate your organization. Make people remember you. Guess what? People are going to leave that organization. They're going to go to other companies. When they're in those other companies and somebody pops up and says, hey, we need a new business intelligence solution. Who do you want them to remember? You want them to remember you and you want to give them a reason to be memorable. There's a couple of those things that we talked about that can make you memorable, make you unique, make you different uh, in the minds of your prospect. So what I'd like to do now is give you some action steps that I'd like you to take because we're just about at the end of this session. So utilizing the materials that I've provided for you in your Ultimate Small Business Marketing System, I'd like you to go through that process of creating the client grid, okay? Itemizing your clients and then determining what are those key characteristics of those clients. What are the demographics? What are the psychographics? What are the geographics, okay? So utilize that. The second thing I'd like you to do is complete the forms in your workbook. Then I want you to go through that process of describing your ideal client in detail, as we've discussed. I want you to go through the process of selecting those five or ten of your existing clients that meet that description of your ideal target market. Go out and interview them and ask them those questions that we talked about. Now, if you, again, you're not sure what questions you should ask them, it's in the workbooks. Again, review these materials or you can pick up the phone and ring me or drop me an email to richard.duffy at sap.com. Be more than happy to jump on the phone, get on Skype, whatever the case may be, and just run through some of those things with you. Uh, and again, profile your competition. So if you do those things uh, in preparation for our next session, you'll be well equipped uh, as we go forwards in the process. Thanks very much.